Hello, Microbial Nation, and welcome to another episode of The Micro Moment, that show that takes you down to the microscopic level to view the world just a little bit differently. I'm your host, Tess. And I'm John. And I'm Julie. And if you are still with us, and if you joined us last week or any of the previous weeks for this season, you know we are talking bioterrorism. Specifically, we are talking about the horrible, horrible events of bioterrorism in World War II, which I do believe is probably the most horrific and most profound bioterrorism events in human history, in part because it was so consciously done. Yeah, I mean, previous episode I talked about how Japan was actively testing on prisoners and doing live vivisections to see what was going on. And over 300,000 people ended up dying because of these. Yeah, and I think that was the first time on the history of the micro moment we had to administer a trigger warning because that was one of the most awful things I've ever heard in my entire life. Yeah, I am partially sorry that I brought it up, but I believe it's something that we should all learn. Oh, 100%. It's something that, I, you know, it's important to know. It's an important bit of history that we hope to never repeat, but I hope I never have to hear it again. Once was enough. Yeah. Are we are we diving into anything worse or not as worse? I don't think mine are nearly as bad as what you foretold last episode. Okay, uh, that's kind of good because it, that was a pretty depressing episode. Yeah, I hope we've all cleansed our soul from that moment. People have hugged their dogs and watched some good movies and had some happy TV shows. Are you saying you got lots of pets in the meantime? Exactly, and we drank lots of wine to help forget about it, but it hasn't worked yet, so there's that. The only way to do is to... Keep on trying. Keep on keeping on. <laughs> Keep on trying and move on, on to the next topic. Yeah, so we are not changing our time in history. So if you were with us last episode and our first part of World War II bioterrorism, you heard a little bit about the different scientific advancements, the different things that changed in the home, and a little bit about the societal changes that happened between 1900 and 1945, which is the time period we're talking about. I think all of our stories actually are specifically in the World War II period, 1930 to about 1945. But if you weren't here, if you need a little recap to readjust to the context of where we are in human history, in this time period, we saw the atomic bomb, which everyone knows now because of Oppenheimer. Uh, we also saw the development on a much lighter, happier note. We also saw the development of antibiotics, particularly penicillin was developed in this time, which is a huge collaborative effort between the British and the Americans, particularly Flory Heatley Chain and Alexander Fleming some 10 years before. Uh, this is also a time period where we saw some of the large pharmaceuticals in America, who you he still hear about today, working on penicillin, such as Merck. But if you want to dive into that in any more considerable detail, which I won't do here, which I could, but I won't, we do have a number of podcasts on it. And it is a very interesting story, I got to say, as we keep coming back to it time and time again. And it's a much happier story than what we're going to talk about today. Don't forget, we also had suffrage rights coming about during the turn of the century as well. Oh, yeah. I didn't even talk about the other things, just the scientific advancements. Yeah. So women got the right to vote in 1920 in America and in uh, various other countries during this time, too. Not in the same year, but a different time period. So that was good. We see a great momentum towards civil rights, one that would carry out through the 60s and is still a movement we are fighting for today in America and in other parts of the world. We also saw, as far as things that changed in the home, we got indoor plumbing, we got electricity, and we got automobiles. So those were all you know, pretty fantastic advancements at the time, things that we still use on the daily basis to help us run and function in our own daily lives. So that is a little bit where we are in world in the time. A lot of things are looking a lot more modern. There's a lot more things that we can attach to and relate to which is, makes us all the more evil, I feel, because it seems so much closer to our own lives and history. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting aspect. The closer it is to where we are today, the more severe it feels, because 
it's still in the zeitgeist. It's still part of our collective memory. 100%. Anyways, let's dive into bioterrorism of World War II. Part two. Part two. This is episode, what, six in our series of bioterrorism? We started all the way back in ancient times. Yep, this is episode six. And I believe we have at least two more to go. Yeah, I think we could squeeze out another two episodes. Oh, uh, yeah, I think so. We have uh, we have many more things to talk about, unfortunately, on how evil scientists can be manipulating our little microscopic friends for the most terrible, heinous crimes ever known to man. Right. But today we go into America's bioterrorism at Fort Detrick. Dietrich? Dertrick. I think it's Dietrich. Dietrich. That, sounds, that sounds about right. Americans' bioterrorism events at Fort Detrick. Have you guys heard of Fort Detrick before? Probably why I said Detrick. I, I think it's in my head somewhere. It is the site of a number of moments in history called out in America for biological warfare. And I'm sure Fort Detrick will come back into our series in bioterrorism in the next two episodes. Ooh, ominous foreboding. Yes. But first, before I dive into this little story on Fort Detrick, I want to talk a little bit about my sources because this is something I always forget. And I always have so many sources. So these are my top sources, I guess. Uh, First, we had... Biological Warfare and Bioterrorism, a historical review written by Stefan Rydell, MD, PhD. History of Fort Detrick by the Fort Detrick Alliance. The PBS article on a history of biological weapons. And of course, Chris Holmes' book, Spores, Plague, and History. I also read some stuff on the CDC, of course. There is another PBS article on Paul Fields. And the BBC article, The Mystery of Anthrax Island and the Seeds of Death, which we'll probably talk about in the second portion of what I'm going to do. So I'm going to tell a story. I think Julie's going to tell a story. And then I will finish up by telling the final story in the series of World War II bioterrorism. So you guys ready? We're ready. Let's go. So all across the World War II brought an interest into our microbial friends as weapons. While the Japanese unit that we heard about last week was by far the most active and aggressive in the pursuit of biological warfare, several other countries began serious research into how to harness the limitless potential of our microbial friends as the ultimate weapon. Notably, it was the Germany in World War I was perhaps at the front runner of biological warfare advancements during this time. But in 1942, Hitler, with all of his heinous crimes, decided to not have an officially established biological warfare unit, which was honestly a great surprise to me. I thought you know, Hitler, with all of his not caring at all about people, would have delved into biological warfare. But I guess some of the German scientists were also surprised by this because some of them that were researching biological warfare in World War I were very upset by this decision and actually would collaborate with the Japanese scientists and help develop Unit 731 for future research into this area. Really? I had no idea about that. Yeah. Yeah. But what I'm going to talk about today is not Germany. It's not J- Japan but about the Allies, particularly the United States, spreading into this emerging war strategy of bioterrorism. And my part two is about the British. The U.S. dabbled in this research before the 1940s, but it really was in 1942, while the Germans were shying away from bioweapons, the U.S. and much of the rest of the world were really ramping up into this area of research. Like so many things in America in the 1940s, they took a pretty aggressive act and massed it into a place you might send your kids in the summer. This place was called Camp Dietrich. I don't know why they always call something a camp. I don't know. I think they dropped the camp and now they call it Fort, though. Yes, now it is Fort, uh, which is a little bit more of an aggressive, established, I guess, name for it. But Camp Dietrich just sounds like some place you'd send your kids for summer camp. Camp Dietrich was close enough to the suits in D.C. so that they could easily get to it, but far enough away, or so they say, that if an oopsie was to happen, it wasn't going to cause mass catastrophe. But I really wonder if this was true. 
microbes sure do have a way of getting around. Yeah. Fast, quickly, and undercover. Yep, you can try as much as you can, but as we saw during the pandemic, it still spreads. Spreads and spreads. Camp Dietrich has been in military occupation since the 1930s, where it was home to the 104th Aero Squadron of the 29th Division of the Maryland National Guard, and later became a pilot training center before the outbreak of World War II. So it didn't actually have its roots in bioterrorism or even as a medical facility. And like any secret government facility, there is a laundry list of conspiracy theories about Camp Dietrich from everything from being a hub of spreading cancer to creating HIV to being the source of COVID. But these are conspiracy theories. And I call this out because with so much hearsay happening, sometimes it is hard to get a fair picture of what went on at Fort Dietrich. And I actually found it quite hard to do research into this topic because it was so many of those conspiracy articles kept popping up. Did you guys find it hard to kind of research bioterrorism during World War II? Not for me. I feel like, I don't know, I didn't really come across anything that I would say was a conspiracy theory. Maybe because it was so horrendous, it just usurped all yeah, it's All like, what What else do you really want to make that out to be? Right. It's like, what, they had aliens there, too? Like, what, what would that bring to the table? Yeah, it's already the most terrible story ever. I did find that, like, a few of the sources, like, came up over and over again, and they looked like sort of official military-type um, white papers, almost, on them for educational purposes. Um, so they, they kind of look like officially, but obviously they weren't like CDC or anything, but they did seem to have like that military awareness type of feel to some of the papers that I read. Yeah, I would say that's a very fair assessment. So like we said, Camp Dietrich is now Fort Dietrich, and it's still researching anthrax, anthra- or Bacillus anthracis, uh, which we've talked about quite a lot through our journey of bioterrorism throughout history. And if Fort Dietrich sounds familiar to you, You might have been around in 2001 with the anthrax attacks. This strain, the strain of uh, Bacillus anthracis that occurred during this 2001 outbreak was actually traced back to Fort Detrick. But we will do a much deeper dive into this incident in a later episode in the series. It might be the next portion that we do, I think. Yeah, I think we'll do Cold War... To 2001 up to modern times will be the next section. So 2000, the anthrax scare of 2001 is definitely going to come up. So we will not dive into it here. But we are talking about Camp Dietrich in the 1940s. In 1956, uh, Fort Dietrich or Camp Dietrich became Fort Dietrich. And today is also known as the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases. Bacillus anthracis, Clostridium botulinum, Brucella sui were the major research organisms in the beginning of the facility's inception, but several others were also researched over time. But as more and more leaked out about the Japanese Unit 731, the Americans doubled down, opening more and more facilities. There are facilities in Horn Island off Mississippi, Granite Peak in Utah, and Vigo in Indiana. And there are lots of parallels I could draw between this and the Manhattan Project or what I learned about the Manhattan Project and the movie Oppenheimer, which I learned was actually fairly accurate. It's not mutually assert, uh, assured destruction, but it's kind of like an arms race, right? We had it uh, like during the atomic, you know, atomic weapons and we're also trying to do this on the down low with biological weapons. Yeah, and they created a camp. They created a little town with multiple scientists who lived there, and they constructed all these buildings to have this research. And they have different places in the country that were responsible for different elements of it. I believe it's Vigo in Indiana that was responsible for sort of scaling up and manufacturing anything that they came, which I think is around the same area that they had in the Manhattan Project, too. I think they had New Mexico, Utah, and Indiana. I'm not sure on that. They didn't dwell on that in Oppenheimer. No. Anyways, back to Fort Dietrich. Throughout the World War II time, Camp Dietrich would create 
5,000 bombs filled with Bacillus anthracis. But luckily, unlike the Manhattan Project, the production facility did not have what it takes to scale up this strategy and produce enough materials to be a viable option in the war. And these 5,000 bombs will come back later. Really? I hope not. <laughs> yes. Well, not later in our time, but their origin is actually quite interesting. Okay. This facility was the premier research location of biowarfare for the U.S. starting in 1943, which is right about the time the U.S. entered into World War II. Soon it rose to some 250 buildings and 5,000 people could call this place home. Like I said, it was a little city just like the Manhattan Project, but on a far smaller scale. I can't remember what I read for Manhattan, but I think it was considerably smaller, like maybe one-fifth. While the U.S. never, as far as we know, used biowarfare during World War II, they were researching how to shove anthrax into bombs and how to effectively spread these spores in different sized bombs. They did research on Q fever, tularemia, and botulinum toxin. Again, these are things that we've talked about in the past uh, in various aspects of bioterrorism. Oh my god, a bomb with botulinum toxin? Yeah. That's terrible. Like, Botox for everyone. Well, I, I've watched uh, stories of people that were given blowfish. Mm -hmm. And I think it had, is it blowfish that has the botulinum toxin? Um, they have a poison. And I think botulinum toxin does a similar thing where he ended up being paralyzed and he couldn't move. Yeah. I mean, that's what Botox yeah, comes from. So Bo is botulinum can you, tox. Or, can you imagine dying being paralyzed like that? And you it know, would be yeah, it's terrifying. Horrifying. Yeah. So Q fever is caused by Coaxia burnetti, tularemia is caused by Francisella tularanius, and botulinum toxis is caused by Clostridium botulinum, all of which are wicked nasty diseases, and none of them I don't think we've ever discussed in any considerable detail on this podcast. No, I don't think we have. I mean, we've talked about a bunch of microbes, but they're not coming to mind. Yeah, there's probably no way to really know how many innocent animals or exactly what was harmed during the time that the Americans were researching and doing their tests here. And although none of them died, America also tested on human subjects. They tested on the Seventh-day Adventists, who were conscientious objectors to the war, but I'm fairly certain this could never happen today. It is grotesquely unethical. And I'm surprised it happened in the 1940s, honestly. Yeah, that, there's no way they'd be able to get away with that today. Yeah, I don't think conscientious objectors um, should be subjected to that. Biowarfare continued in the U.S. long after World War II, from Roosevelt to Eisenhower, through Kennedy and Johnson and Nixon. So that's like, what, one, two, three, four, five different presidents. 20 years about yeah through the research was thought important for a number of u.s challenges during the time from world war ii to the korean war to the cold war and as we learned about before they thought that they could gain glean some more information from unit 731's research and gave them amnesty for it which i am still upset about but we are not here to talk so much about the future of bioterrorism in America up and through the USSR Cuban Missile of 1962. We are talking just in World War II today. So during all this time and the obvious occupational hazard of working here, Camp Dietrich was actually a pretty safe work environment considering you were trying to create biological weapons. For every one million hours worked, there were 10 infections in the time three people died, two from anthrax and one from encephalitis, which I'm not really sure where they got encephalitis because I'm not sure I've talked about any pathogens that cause encephalitis. I mean, we have one around the northeastern, triple E, eastern equine encephalitis. Yeah, but none of the pathogens I talked about associated with Camp Dietrich so far cause encephalitis as far as I know. True. So... At this time, we talked a little bit of Camp Dietrich. We have always been talking about anthracis bacillus, and it's usually at some point during the podcast I like to talk a little bit more about the biology, the symptoms, the cures, about the pathogen that we are diving into the most, which right now is uh, bacillus anthracis. So I want to talk a little bit about cures and treatments. Any ideas what cures and treatments are for bacillus anthracis? 
I'm assuming it's some sort of antibiotic, but I don't know which antibiotic. You are correct, sir. So in the past, we discussed what makes Bacillus anthracis such a scary biowarfare threat in the past. We've also discussed how this microbe has actually brought a great deal of good to our world with Robert Koch and Louis Pasteur. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about the cures and treatments, specifically the antibiotics that are used to treat Bacillus anthracis if you are so unfortunate enough to inhale, digest, or inject this microbe. The most used form of treatment is, of course, antibiotics, but it must be administered as soon as possible for best outcomes, which is true for a lot of pathogens and diseases. The quicker you get treatment, the better off you're going to be. Particularly with your pestis. Yep, that one too. Common antibiotics for anthrax include ciprofloxin and doxycycline, which ciprofloxin is often abbreviated to cipro, so that is how I will refer to it in the remainder of this section. So gather around for a tale of antibiotics with a little bit of a twist. Let's dive into the mechanisms of cipro and doxycycline. You've heard of penicillin, right? Of course, because we've done so much on it. I hope you have a good idea about it. I'm not sure if we talked about the mechanism, but penicillin is able to bind in such a way that prevents some bacteria from forming their cell wall, thus depleting their populations. But this is not the only strategy in antibiotic arsenal. Let me introduce you to the rebellious cousin, ciprofloxin. While penicillin has its own style of defeating pathogenic bacteria, Cipro takes a completely different approach. Instead of the cell wall, it goes straight for the bacteria's essential enzymes called topoisomerases, specifically topoisomerase 2, also known as DNA gyrase, and topoisomerase 4. These enzymes are critical for the bacteria's DNA's daily task, such as replication, which is making copies, transcription, which is reading the genetic script, and repair, which is fixing the mistakes, and recombination, which is mixing and matching your genes, well, their genes. So without the ability to replicate, transcribe, and repair, Uh, Suddenly, this pathogen doesn't have a lot of strategies for survival and is at a severe disadvantage to continue onward. With these typoisomerases out of commission, bacteria can't replicate or read their genetic instructions properly. They become powerless and can't grow or spread. Doxycycline takes yet another approach to defending us from pathogen. It binds to the 30S ribosomal subunit, ultimately preventing the microbe from producing proteins, which are also vital to survival, as I hope everyone knows, because we have a big obsession with protein powder right now across uh, the world, I think, definitely in America. So this particular mechanism that prevents a microbe from doing something that is vital to survival is called what? Bacteriostatic, right? Because it's not killing them, it's just like inhibiting them, right? Yes. Whereas bactericidal kills them. Kill. Kill. If anthrax has gotten into the body and start producing toxins, there are also antitoxins that people can take, but they must be administered as soon as possible for best treatment. Yeah, so I think that's all I have on the Americans and Camp Diedrich and a little bit about mechanisms of antibiotics. So, Julie, do you want to tell us a little bit more about Unit 731, and then we can jump back and finish it up with the Brits? Well, to build on what John talked about last time, Ishii built his dream facility in Manchuria, where he had four boilers capable of producing one ton of culture media each sterilized in one ton uh-huh wow, that is a lot i mean most people just dream to live in a castle yeah. or like have an in-ground pool well he had 14 autoclaves and they were called the aishi cultivators and those were each capable of producing 30 kilograms of bacterial cell mass and you know his intentions were evil so that was all bad stuff he was doing And uh, he had the capacity to maintain plague, cholera, typhoid, paratyphoid, dysentery, anthrax, gas, gangrene, tetanus, and glanders, which is what I talked about last time, which is a disease mostly, or it used to be with uh, horses. But since all of this lovely 
investigation into glanders, they have figured out how to weaponize it. And it is now considered a class B uh, bioterrorism agent. Great, great, great. Yeah, back to this little story. So that facility was also equipped with the capacity to mass produce fleas, which guess what they use that for? Yersinia pasta. Mm-hmm. And not very comfortingly, they had their own fleet of airplanes for experiments. What did they do with the airplanes? They dropped stuff on unsuspecting communities. Remember I was telling you they had two bioterrorism attacks on Chinese where they're dropping fleas and like sand and oh, corn right, right, and all sorts right. I, of stuff. I tried to wipe that from my memory. Thank you for bringing yeah. that back to the surface. Yes, you're welcome. So they were given airplanes for their facility to carry out these tests. There's so many people that like had to say, yes, this is all right. It's scary. It's scary how many people had to be like, yep, here's some airplanes. Here's your autoclaves. Here's your land. Go for it. Terrifying. Yeah. And at his little facility, which I would be curious to know what the status of this facility is. Did they like raise it to the ground? Like, because he. Yeah, they they destroyed it. But uh, China came back and built a museum back on where 731 was as a remembrance of what happened. Well, I guess in the battle days, uh, they could produce 300 kilograms of plague monthly, in addition to the other I don't even pathogens. know how many spores that would be. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, all that, you know, just to say that um, they did do some testing with cholera, uh, sorry, with glanders. So, yeah, they did do experiments, obviously, on, you know, they started out doing it on people who dissented, but they just moved on to the general, you know, population and prisoners. And as John stated last time, you know, hundreds of thousands of people died. And they don't even know the number, really, because they weren't keeping great records back then. And they spread the plague around and other diseases. So who knows, you know, untold animals and people uh, were killed. And, you know, so glanders is still around. It is still an issue somewhere. I think I read 30% of the horses in Mongolia have glanders. And I don't know if that has anything to do with, you know, that there was a lot of testing done in that area. 30%? percent hmm Wow, that's a lot. Yeah. That's a hard one because, like, Mongolia is, I mean, it's traditionally been like a horse derived civilization where they relied on horses. But, like, yeah, a lot of research was done at Unit 731. And who knows if they spread it to Mongolia. Yeah. And they, you know, in all of these experimentations and, you know, on purpose infecting horses and other livestock with glanders, those animals weren't always called at the end of, you know, the confrontation, they were released out into the countryside. And so a lot of those animals could have been carrying these diseases when uh, they left and spreading it around also. So, um, and Glanders was also, as as Tess mentioned, at uh, camp or Fort Detrick, they did do experiments. And like I said, they are still considering Glanders person to person Infection is not very likely, but like I said, through these experiments over the years, they have figured out how to spread it in a way that would be deadly for people. And it's not something that they can cure. There isn't like a lot of uh, treatment for it. And so it's, it is considered, like I said, a class B bioterrorism agent to this day. Do you know how deadly it is to humans? If you contract it and it like gets into your lungs. I think it's more than 50% fatal. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty a lot. So anything else on glanders? Nope, it's not my favorite. Like you said, leave the animals alone. Well, I will say something. Tess's favorite seems to be anthrax because I feel like every bioterrorism episode she's talked about anthrax. And you saying it, you, this is the second time you've talked about glanders, so... I mean, favorite, I think, is a strong word. Highly interesting might be a little bit. 
Okay. And it's not my fault that anth- Bacillus anthracius happens throughout human history in the most significantly horrifying ways. That's not on me. I'm not saying it's on you that it happened. I just found it super interesting when you when you research stuff like this. Like it never occurred to me that by poisoning the horses and livestock of your enemy, you would be delivering a deadly blow to them and could win a war that way. And I just I had never thought of it. So I just found it really fascinating in the most horrible way. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I don't think it's a way that normal people think. I mean, yeah, it's if you think about it, if it's not even spreading to other people, just going after the food source of a country, like, that's a good way to cripple that country. Can we finally leave Unit 731? Please. <laughs> we will jump back over to Europe and jump across the pond from my last story to enter into British territory. What did the Brits got on during this time? Oh, quite quite a bit. Quite a bit, actually. In the midst of this global turmoil, where the Britons were very much at the central of a lot of heinous crimes in war, they too were venturing into the shadowy realm of bioterrorism with their very own version of Camp Dietrich, known as Portun Down. Originally constructed in 1916 to research chemical weapons. In 1941, Portun Down scientists approached none other than Winston Churchill with the audacious plan. They had developed cattle cakes, which were linseed cakes laced with anthrax, and their main aim was audacious as it was sinister. They planned to create a staggering Five million of these deadly treats. Their goal was to drop them on the pastures of German cattle. Once again, trying to debilitate a country's food source as a means to prevent them and cripple their forces in the war. Yeah, in Germany, like 60 years prior, oh, fourth of the livestock was being hit by anthrax. Yeah. So, yeah, then that's how Robert Koch devised germ theory. It was a, a decent plan, I guess. And the British, in their witty, darkly ironic humor, had a quite the name for this operation. Any guesses? I don't know. I'm not very witty when it comes to humor. The Brits are. Yeah. I don't know. Every single operation I feel from World War II that came from the Brits has a little bit of dark, dark comedic undertones to it. So what what, what do we have? So we're wiping up the whole cattle industry of Germany. And they named it Operation Vegetarian. Oh, my God. Uh, Of course (laughs) they would name that. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I was actually thinking that when we were just talking about <laughs> about that. I should have been British, I guess. Yeah. Um, the Brits are really good at naming things. I'll give them that. All right. Operation Vegetarian. In the year 1942, there was a very chilling experiment that happened at Porton Down. The scientists there under the leadership of Fields, or maybe it's Fields. I think it's Fields released an anthrax bomb on the remote Scottish island of Grenard. These experiments would leave the island with the name you hope to never find on your travel itinerary, Anthrax Island. Of course. They released the bombs from just a few feet and had sheep in cages at another location of this small remote island. Unsurprisingly, the sheep exposed to the deadly spores died. But it wasn't just these sheep that faced certain death. Over in the small settlements of Laid, sheep and cattle were starting to get sick too, and the townspeople started to wonder. But the government, wanting to keep the townsfolk quiet, gladly compensated the farmers for their dead livestock while subtly pointing the finger at a Greek ship disposing of sick livestock and blamed them on spreading the spores. But wait, there is more. An attempt to replicate their success she says in air quotes they dropped another anthrax bomb in the same area a few weeks later this time the bomb dropped from the from an airplane 
There were no casualties among the sheep because the bomb actually dropped in a bog and was unable to release any of the spores. Undeterred, a few months later, they had a more successful drop in Wales. I don't really know why they changed the location. I looked for it. I couldn't really figure it out. I figured Wales is probably, you know, even more populated than the island of Grenard, but I couldn't see anything that led them to that location. But this successful dropping of the anthrax bomb in Wales was enough to prove to the British government anthrax bombs were possible. But... They were unable to scale up this project. So who, oh who, would they turn to for their manufacturing troubles? The good old U.S.? The good old U.S. Turned to them for penicillin and turned to them for anthrax bombs. Actually, I'm surprised, like, if they repeated on that island several weeks later, the sheep didn't get sick and die from the spores that were still there. Well, so they dropped, they knew that the bomb dropped in a bog and therefore did not release its spores. Well, no, from the previous experiment, because there are spores, I'm a little surprised. Yeah, but they, did, they knew it wasn't successful. Oh, okay. You know, like they knew that the spores were not released. Yeah. So they had to go do a second trial in a different location. But maybe that's why they went to a different location, because there were so many anthrax spores there. And the anthrax, because anthrax can live in soil, right? Yeah, but it's typically not in a form that is highly contagious. So if it's in the soil and a plant grows in that soil, does the plant have anthrax in it or does it and then could be ingested by an animal or does it not work that way? It's more like when an animal is sort of digging around and might put their hoof into the soil and that digs up dirt, the spores will be aerosolized in that dirt and then they'll breathe them in and inhale them. Yeah, and I would imagine, like, I guess, like, horses roll in the dirt, and other animals probably do the same, And but yeah, lots of animals like to dig in the dirt. Yeah. So, in November 1942, Sir Paul Files and his colleagues embarked on a significant mission to Washington, D.C., much like Flory Chain and Heatley, well, actually, Chain didn't go, Flory and Heatley did come to America for the same purpose, to request the United States to establish production facilities capable of manufacturing substantial quantities of anthrax bacterial spores, referred to as Agent N, and botulinum toxin, known as Agent X. Florian Heatley came to just produce some more penicillin. Much less nefarious acts. Their initial order was particularly notable. They wanted seven pounds of Agent X, which is botulinum toxin, an extremely potent toxin produced by the bacterium Clostridium botulinum. Botulinum toxin is known for its extreme toxicity and the potential to cause paralysis and death if those exposed, and is also where the name Botox comes from. Botulinum toxin. Botox. The more you know. Mm Mm-hmm. In response to this request, an American team led by Ira Baldwin at Camp Dietrich da, 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 comes back in Maryland, began work on producing Agent X in June 1943. Remarkably, they were able to fulfill this order within relatively short span of a couple of months. In March 1944, Churchill ordered 5,000 anthrax bombs from the Americans. Remember when I said the Americans created 5,000 anthrax bombs? Yep. It was for the British. Files began drawing up plans as to when and where they were going to drop these bombs, trying to find the most strategic way to drop these most horrifying bombs. And then, fortunately for everyone, the war ended. Yay. Huzzah. Well, in Europe anyways, and there was no need for the anthrax bombs. We still you know, haven't really got to the atomic bomb, but we're not really going to talk about that here. But poor Grenard Island remained laced with anthrax spores until 1986. So it was like uninhabitable till 1986? Yeah. I mean, it's quite a small island. But yeah, it was quarantined off. There were signs saying no one can come here. There were signs saying this was government property and you will be in trouble if you trespass and blah, blah, blah. In another strange moment in history where we are commending people's bioterrorism acts, Paul Files got knighted. 
And probably fortunately for him, he died one year before the 1972 Biological Weapons Convention that banned offensive biological weapons. So similar to the Geneva. But more specific. I do want to say, like, when you said Compound X, I went to Powerpuff Girls, but that's Chemical X that they use to make them. Ah, but this is Agent X. Yeah, Agent X, sorry. Which almost seems like something in W07. Yeah. In the end, Operation Vegetarian would spark another, but I would say potentially good act of bioterrorism. That wasn't really bioterrorism, but could be considered bioterrorism, known as Dark Harvest. But that's a story for a later time. Ooh, leaving us hanging. Mm -hmm. Fields also towed the tale of another bioterrorism covert operation the British led in World War II, although the British never actually said that this happened. Fields talked about the assassination of Nazi leader Renard Heydrich was ambushed and later died of what appeared to be minor wounds. As far as I could tell, the British didn't substantiate his claims, but Files later said he supplied the assassins with botulinum toxin that was used in this attack and may be the reason he died with what was just described as minor wounds. The pursuit of biowarfare during World War II, as demonstrated by Operation Vegetarian and similar endeavors that we've discussed today, was indeed a dark chapter in history. The advent of the atomic bomb and the realization of the catastrophic potential of biowarfare agents highlighted the immense danger and indiscriminate nature of these weapons. Microbes don't discriminate, and I think we've talked about that pretty significantly over the past few episodes, actually. They are not targeted. A lot of them aren't, yeah. And microbes are not evil. The evil comes from the scientists manipulating the microbes, not the microbes themselves. Yeah, they're just trying to live their best life. They are driven by their survival instincts. And when used as weapons, this can backfire, affecting not only the attendant targets, but also the aggressors and innocent civilians caught in the crossfire. And we saw this demonstrated in Unit 731, where 1,700 of their own people contracted one of the diseases. Yep. So as we come to a close on World War II bioterrorism, the stark reality underscores the ethical and moral dilemmas surrounding biowarfare. The potential for unintended consequences and the immense suffering it can cause make it a horrifying and dangerous tactic in warfare. It also underscores the importance of international agreements and conventions, such as the Biological Weapons Convention, which seeks to prohibit the development, production, and use of biological weapons. We've also talked about another number of other agreements between countries to try to inhibit the use of biological warfare. So I don't know about you guys, but I think I'm ready to close this chapter on bioterrorism in World War II. I second that. Me too. It really does bring into focus how evil people can be. So evil. They can be, for sure. Mm -hmm. So as we bring this to a close, we hope you found this very interesting. We hope you learned a little bit. And if you did, let us know what was your favorite fact of the podcast or most interesting of the podcast by sending a comment to us on Instagram at microbials m-i-c-r-o-b-i-g-a-l-s we are also on twitter and threads on the same name so go ahead and send us some feedback you can also send it to microbials at gmail.com and of course we hope that you rate and subscribe because next time we are diving into bioterrorism from the discovery of dna that's right up till now we have still not discovered dna and all of this has happened wow wow so in our next podcast or our next little section in history, which, I mean, probably is going to be a two-parter, we will talk about bioterrorism from the discovery of DNA up until present day. Anyone have any idea what they're going to research? I'll give you two guesses of what mine is, but you only need one. It has to do with anthrax? Of course it does. I've actually alluded to two stories that happened during that time period. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if there's any glander stories uh, post 1950s. I think I'm going to have to swap mine out. Not do glanders. I mean, let's see, I could 
I could, I don't know, maybe see what the Soviet Russia was doing, or maybe the time that the CIA spread a, a bacteria amongst the population. Oh, uh, that sounds interesting. Yeah, the Cold War is definitely going to come into play in our next section. But you'll just have to find out on the next episode. So we hope you join us then. Until then. Feed your microbes. Feed your guts. Make your microbes love you lots. Bye. Bye.